We, the Center for Global Development, we're a group that try and see how we can make the international system that supports global development work more effectively. How do we finance infrastructure in the poorest parts of the world? How do we increase productivity in agriculture? What kind of policy brings out the best outcomes? What CGD is about is you can ask those difficult questions that people refuse to ask and actually find solutions. We're thinking about how climate change will impact migration patterns, how that will in turn have impacts on people's health. It's challenging to be able to align budget with ambitious programmatic goals, but it can be done. If you can help to make things a little bit better, that's a good way to spend your time. Good morning, good afternoon. Welcome to the Center for Global Development and welcome to this conversation, which I'm really looking forward to on the European Investment Bank, the EIB, uh, which of course, as uh, many of you probably know already, is, a, is not just a, a long-term and, and large uh, contributor to development finance. I think the numbers last year were $12 billion of financing outside the the EU that the uh, EIB does, but uh, it has a couple of additional features. One, of course, is that it is uh, an institution that operates both outside the borders of the EU, but also has a very large role to play within the EU, and there are synergies that come from one across the other, but also differences which uh, we can explore. And the, and the second, of course, is that uh, uh, the EIB was very early in, in making sustainability and climate change sort of core feature of its operations and, and wanting to go down that road. And, and so today we, we have the opportunity to explore some of those uh, uh, topics. And, and uh, we have uh, Werner Hoyer, who is the president uh, of the EIB, and, and also very happy that Maria Shaw Bergen is uh, with us. She's uh, the director of lending for Africa, Caribbean, Pacific, uh, Asia, and Latin America. And I'm trying to figure out what that leaves out for others, uh, Maria. Sure. But, but, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm also very happy that I'm joined uh, uh, by Michaela Gavas, uh, who of course is the uh, managing director for CGD's work in Europe and, uh, and uh, follows not just uh, EIB, but the uh, European development finance issues very closely. So without further ado, what we have an hour and what we thought we would do is perhaps I'll just start when with you, give you an opportunity to, to say a little bit your vision and, and here we are halfway through the EIB's Climate Bank Roadmap. And uh, I know you and I talked a, uh, a few months ago and, and you were saying so what had been easy and what had been difficult and where you are now and how you see the way forward. So maybe I'll give you a few minutes to just lay that out and then we can get into a, a conversation on uh, uh, other topics that flow from it. So thank you both for coming and uh, over to you, Ben. Thank you very much, Masood. It's a pleasure to be back here. And uh, thank you for, for your kind introduction. Uh, welcome, hello to all of you. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Many of you are remotely connected, so whatever time zone you are living in. Uh, it's a great topic that you put uh, in front of me. Um, the MDBs have a big role to play when it comes to climate action. And we see that we are not, we are not by far not where we should be on this issue. And things are getting more and more urgent as we get from the scientists presented every day. So we need to address these issues more forcefully. We were in a relatively lucky position there because uh, when classical infrastructure finance, SME finance, uh, innovation finance became too boring for us, uh, we detected climate because it was obvious a couple of years ago that uh, our shareholders, which are the 27 member states of the European Union, by the way, at that time, 28, would expect us to be very active on, on, on climate issues. 
And uh, for us, uh, I must say, this has never been predominantly an ideological issue. It has been an economic issue. So we made the business case for climate action. And I think we would not, uh, we, were, we were surprised, of course, when the developments after 2019 then came in, and not least the war in Ukraine after which we confirmed the necessity to go for strategic autonomy, more independence, and uh, seriousness on, on the climate issue. So in 2019, I was in the honorable position to go to the United Nations at the, to the General Assembly in the Climate Week, in the Climate Summit, and uh, develop our ideas about climate finance. And at that time, I said, OK, we are going to go for climate fully. So we have an ambition to be Paris aligned within a very short period of time. By 2022, we want to be 25, more than 50% of our lending related to climate projects. And by the year 2030, we want to have triggered climate related um, projects around one trillion at least dollars or euros at that, at that time. They were pretty much the same thing. Uh, so we are on a very good track there. This is uh, what really surprises me, myself. But uh, our colleagues have, have done a great job. And the demand for this issue is, of course, uh, enormous. Uh, so uh, we are invited again and again to come with all kinds of action papers and, and proposals for the international community. And this, uh, as president of the, this European multilateral development institution, I welcome these calls very wholeheartedly. Without going into details, let me share with you how we at the EIB anticipated and transformed ourselves uh, timely in order to tackle the most urgent global challenges. So one thing was clear from the beginning when after the, we had uh, made this proclamation in the, this announcement in the General Assembly without having consulted the member states of the European Union beforehand. We needed to convince them afterwards. You can imagine the uh, inclination to go more into climate issues is um, even unevenly distributed among the member states of the European Union. So we had to try to give justice to each and every one. And of course, some member states of the European Union are, were, still are, to a large extent, dependent on fossil fuels. And uh, we had to convince them that it makes sense to cross the line. And uh, one issue in this context was uh, if you want to take everybody on board, you must make sure that politically these people must be able to live with that challenge. Uh, I remember endless talks with one prime minister from a country that is particularly affected by this. And uh, before we got the support finally from the, from the board of directors of the bank, I needed to reassure him that we see, and I'll reveal the country now immediately because I needed to tell, tell him quite clearly that we see that the last coal miner who moves out of the coal mine in Katowice uh, will not be the head of a digital startup in three weeks. So we need to provide help for this transition. So the idea is climate action without just transition is something that, that doesn't, doesn't fly. So uh, we've moved forward since, and, and so far we have achieved the challenges, uh, the, the objectives, and that is uh, definitely not, not easy. So in a certain way, innovative financing is in our DNA. So uh, the transformation was for a bank that was founded uh, more than half a century ago, in particular for rebuilding Europe after World War II to repair the or rebuild the destroyed infrastructure and so forth, to look more at the quality of the reconstruction or new construction. And that brought the uh, uh, climate dimension, the green dimension more and more into the game. Uh, then, of course, uh, we had to see this accompanied by the uh, capital market instruments that we would offer. Uh, it was an exciting idea to come up with green bonds. Uh, the first green bonds were issued at the Luxembourg Stock Exchange in 2007. And there were a few people uh, from the avant-garde in our institution who came with that idea, and everybody was of the opinion that's, that's lunatic. Maybe there is a mini niche some, someplace for, for green bonds. And uh, of course, that green bond market is now 
uh, trillion strong. So it is uh, obviously not a totally lunatic idea, but you had to provide reassurances for the people who buy your bonds. You want to be sure if somebody who says, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm convinced that the direction of travel is correct and they will use my money to come up with good climate projects, that this will really happen. So that the next step then was, of course, uh, green bond principles, the, the working group on the global scale, first European, then global, and later the taxonomy for the European Union. So it is a lot of intellectual work in the development of this instrument that came to it. And uh, I must say we are uh, very happy how this has developed. Uh, now, over the next uh, couple of years, uh, it will be obvious that a strategic deliberation comes to it. Uh, the uh, question of dependency on autocratic systems will be of key importance. So because we were a little bit ahead of the curve in 2019, uh, we were center stage when it came to say, okay, we must move out of our dependencies, both when it comes to fossil fuels and other uh, energies, but also from to raw materials and, and other uh, scarce things where we must uh, move ourselves out of the dependency from some uh, countries. So that's where we are, and I must say we are very happy about this development, uh, and uh, we are happy to cooperate with others. Uh, in this field, like in others, in the MDB world, I am of the opinion there is no space for competition, but for synergies and, and cooperation. And this is why we really appreciate the cooperation we have with the others. Thank you very much, uh, Werner. So there's lots of issues you put on the table, and, and let's get into them. Uh, just, just to just say a couple of things that, that you said and pick up on those. I mean, clearly, you got into this earlier. You said that the MDVs weren't by far where we should be, where the MDVs need to be in this space, and we'll come back to that. I think the other point you made, which is about uh, competition. Uh, this morning, we had another session that uh, Annika uh, Sella, sitting in the audience here, uh, had moderated on the jet fees, the Just Energy Transition Partnerships. And uh, there's one phrase that, that was uh, used uh, by Wu Chong, uh, I'm the uh, Director General from uh, the Asian Development Bank, when he said, you know, we have to recognize that what we must compete against is time, not against each other. And uh, I thought that was something that, that was a little bit uh, uh, resonating with, with what you had said as well. And I think the, the, the point that I'd like to come back to a little later in this conversation is the other developed MDBs are now all being asked by their shareholders to move towards tackling global challenges, climate and other global challenges, much more squarely as part of their work. And I think, in a way, your experience uh, as having tried that will have lessons on what works, what doesn't work, and, and uh, what were the difficult bits. So uh, before turning to, to Mikhail, uh, let, let me just ask you one question. You know, now, in this process, um, you had to realign your uh, business models, your organization, your incentive structures to sort of get people to within and uh, to shift towards this approach. What would you say, looking back now, Werner, as, uh, as being, you know, this is really what has turned out to be the difficult part of this exercise that others can then learn and benefit from? I must say that I have overestimated the problems that will come up. I think this transformation internally went surprisingly smoothly. Uh, and that was, of course, a big challenge because the EIB has been a bank that was directed towards the so so solution of problems within the European Union. And there was a little bit of an annex, an appendix to that, that was business outside the European Union, uh, mainly uh, in order to, to prepare candidate countries for membership in the European Union, for membership and all these things. But 
we had to go back to the great ideas of the founding fathers uh, of the EIB. If you go back into the 1950s to the treaties of Rome, that is, are the founding papers also for EIB, uh, they practically defined this bank as the financing arm for the pursuit of strategic objectives of what is now the European Union, at that time the European communities. And uh, that makes it obvious that the European Union has grown in its global role, and therefore it needed a, an arm that would concentrate on, on activities outside the European Union. And of course there, climate-related activities are particularly relevant and necessary. So I think it, this has produced win-win situa situations for, for us and our partners outside the European Union. And therefore, I must say, um, over the last six years, my second mandate in the bank, I was surprised how well our people have done it. So I'm sure that will be reassuring to your colleagues as, as some of them are worrying themselves about how uh, difficult or how easy it will be. And, and the fact that you, in your experience at least, it turned out to be a, a bit easier than you had worried will be good news for it's, them to... Yeah, it's a question of professionalism. Yeah. If you overcharge it ideologically, then it's more difficult. But if you say bring in your professional attitude and knowledge in order to solve a problem that in this case goes beyond the borders of the European Union, then why not doing it? Excellent. Michaela, I'll turn to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Verna, you, you talked about some of the challenges you faced in uh, convincing member states still um, dependent on fossil fuels. Now, you know, a number of prominent African leaders have accused developed uh, countries of hypocrisy in warning them against developing natural gas reserves while also eyeing investments in response to the energy crisis in Europe. Now, they, they maintain that renewables alone cannot develop the continent. And you have stated categorically that the EIB will not reverse its ban on fossil fuel lending. So in that sense, how is the EIB creating the incentives to get countries to borrow for green investments rather than fossil fuels? We are firm on the issue of fossil fuels, but I still can perfectly understand the allegation that you have just uh, repeated vis-a-vis -vis us, because there is some truth in it. I take the, the famous example of green hydrogen, and most of the people in this world, including myself, have fallen in love with the idea of green hydrogen. So now we are developing the technologies uh, in order to be able to produce green hydrogen, and we are again a little bit ahead of the curve because it has been in our DNA for a very, very long, long time to come up with new ideas of energy production. So th we finance the first wind farms, are now probably the, the biggest financier for, for wind and solar and uh, uh, geothermal uh, productivity and uh, production. So we were prepared for this. And uh, now everybody has grabbed it. And you, you imagine that you say, okay, uh, green hydrogen production that can work perfectly, for instance, in sub-Saharan Africa. You put the floating wind farms, another in innovation that we have been financing, around sub southern Africa, and you have an electricity production that allows electrolysis capacity of unknown dimensions that produces green hydrogen at cheap costs. So that's great. But what then? Then you, you transport this green hydrogen uh, on whatever means, to Europe. The production process, the follow-up follow production process takes place in Europe. The uh, output will benefit the European producers and consumers, and we repeat basically what we've done 200 years ago with our colonial approaches. This is why the, the, re the request for a real, serious South-North dialogue is so important and justified. And if we don't engage in that in a credible way, I think we are going to lose this argument about hypocrisy. Thank you. Uh, Maria, can I come to you uh, for uh, a moment? So the, the EIB is effectively the EU climate bank, we've heard. But at the same time, EIB lending to countries outside of the EU, as Masood said, reached uh, approximately 10 billion euros last year. 
So how, how do you see the EIB reconciling its then double focus on climate and development uh, in developing countries? I mean, do you see the need to tackle both uh, at the same time or separately? Well, what we see is they come hand in hand. Development, climate, addressing the effects of climate change and, and doing both mitigation and adaptation, but also bringing innovation into this triangle because what we know is that without innovation there will not be a, a proper future that is sustainable. And therefore, when we are talking with countries and they tell us we, we need access to energy, but it all, they also tell us it has to be affordable energy and we know that fossil fuels, you know, we, we are seeing the spiking in prices, they really create a lot of tensions in countries. While many of these developing countries have plenty of sun, plenty of wind, so by supporting this type of technologies, using batteries as well, green hydrogen, as the president has just explained, these type of things are what can really help countries to address this need of access to energy that is clean and affordable and that is sustainable for the future and that they can do it much faster. And if you think of how long and the cost it would take for a new gas fire plant or a, a major solar plant, you can get electricity much faster with solar. So what we also need to be discussing is, of course, how to make this affordable and how to bring the private sector in, in, into the picture, how to address the transmission lines, the whole grid issue. But we also know mini grids, for example, is an area where we are particularly active. Off, off, off grid solar, even home uh, solar systems, but also mini grids. Because there are areas in Africa where the grid will take decades to come. And you need to start creating that a demonstrable demand so that then the, the, the grid will come. So these are the types of, of conversations that we are having with countries. We tell them, don't invest now in assets that will become stranded assets very soon. Invest in what is the energy of the future and your people and the planet will, will be the beneficiaries. Thank you. Maybe just I'll pick up a bit on the focus on, on one other issue which is raised by the initial comments that you made, uh, Werner, which is, you know, so you have this strategy, you have a plan, you embark on it, uh, want to try and focus on uh, uh, sustainable transitions and both within the EU and outside. And then along comes the, the invasion of Ukraine, the war of Ukraine. And you know, Russia's invasion of Ukraine leads to big trans turmoil, uh, obviously has an impact on the country and the region, but also on how people think about these issues and, uh, and also what they want from the EIB. So you know, people say, well, look, you need to contribute uh, financially to this. And I want to get a little bit of a sense of how you manage the, sh the, the, the consequences of having to then step up and play that role in Ukraine while also keeping focus on your longer term uh, transition objective in terms of the uh, sustainability. But it also raises a more general question on which I'd appreciate your thoughts, which many MDBs and often their boards will say, our role is not to provide surge financing, emergency response financing, you know, that that is, we are here to provide long-term development support and, and we're not structured for it, our financial models don't allow for it, and, and yet the shareholders, every time there is a crisis, it's a food crisis or it comes from, or, or another type of crisis, they turn to the MDBs and say, we need you to step up and provide immediate finance. And they do often, but then they're unhappy about it. And I want to get a little bit of your sense of how, you, how big an issue is this for EIB, but also what's your own personal view? I mean, having been in this business for a long time, do you see the response to emergency financing needs caused by a crisis? A crisis response is part of the MDB's future role, or, or is that something that should be left to other agencies as well? Crisis response, response always needs to address an emergency situation. 
And in an emergency situation, you have to be helpful. So we need to bring in our potential in order to, to ease the problems for our member states or for our partners in the world. On the other hand, crisis situations are a, perfectly, a perfect um, excuse for not pursuing a complicated and difficult course. And that brings the economic consideration in, which Maria mentioned. Uh, we have been told by the insurance companies and by others, great capital places, ask yourself always the question, how long do, we, do you want to have this asset on your balance sheet? And you have, if you have an a, a energy-producing factory someplace in the world, and you have it on the balance sheet for 30 or 40 years, then you better wonder whether this is going to be bringing profits in 30 or 40 years, or at least revenues. And you'll probably come to the conclusion on many of these issues, as we have learned from the private sector uh, insurance companies, for instance, they say, come and be cautious. I don't want to have anything like stranded assets on, on my portfolio. So it, it, the, the situation with Ukraine was the, precisely the situation where you can draw two different consequences. Either you say, OK, let's be gentle and, and slow down the process, or you say, OK, we need to get out of these dependencies, and therefore we need to speed up. And we went for the second option. We said this Ukraine situation, this terrible war, and the geopolitical uh, hiccups that come from it, hiccups is a much too soft word, that forces us to increase speed on this. But that, of course, then makes the, uh, the transition um, more difficult because you need to help people to be able to go through that transition process. But don't go the easy way to say, OK, there's the excuse for not going what you, and in all the circumstances, you would be convinced of. Right. And, and maybe I can ask Maria, I mean, so what, in terms of the re repercussions of the war in Ukraine on the rest of the world, and, and I'm thinking in particular in Africa, you know, with the food and energy crisis and so on, I mean, what are, what are the implications of the EIB's response uh, to Ukraine for disbursements to other countries um, in Africa? Yeah, so what we made sure is that uh, we would not neglect one thing because we were distracted by the other. So we've been going full steam ahead with Ukraine. Very quickly we started disbursing. Within two weeks we were disbursing hundreds of millions to the Ukrainian government because we knew they needed this liquidity. We have continued to support companies in Ukraine and you cannot wait until the end of the war. You need to be, the economy is still going and you need to be helping the economy to, to continue. It, it, it would be completely the wrong approach to not support Ukrainian economy today waiting to see what is going to happen later. And we are, and I like it very much because our president has said the, the infrastructure that we have built, if it's destroyed, we will build it again and we will build it again as many times as, as it, it, it's necessary. So this we continue to do. But that would not be any excuse to, to change or reduce our effort with least developed countries, with vulnerable countries, with fragile states. So what we are doing is, in each one of the cases, looking at how the effect of the war in Ukraine is affecting their reality. We are seeing a lot in the ag agricultural sector. It is about uh, the, the question of, of fertilizers. You know, they have a an, an major issue because they cannot afford fertilizers. So we've been working together with IFAD. And here, again, is, it, is this a crisis a response? Is it urgency? Is it humanitarian? No, it is responding whenever there is the need. So we've partnered up with IFAD for this. We've partnered up with Afrexim Bank to make sure that the smallholders in Africa have access to fertilizers and that they have access to, to grain as well so that they can increase their own production. And in a way, it is forcing them to be less dependent on imported grain and have to increase their own productivity. So we're trying to make a, an opportunity out of what is clearly a very difficult situation. But same thing with regards to access to capital. We saw that small and medium-sized enterprises were finding access to liquidity very difficult. So we really stepped up in terms of our lending to support those that are the ones creating employment in Africa, and it's the, the very small companies. So it's, 
in each one of the cases, in discussions also, of course, with the European Commission, the EU delegations on the ground, and that's where we have our offices based, and discussing with the governments to try to understand how we can use our knowledge, our financial strength, and our technical know-how to respond to the needs as they happen, but not losing that final approach about climate, about sustainability, and about making sure that we are all continuing to make efforts to deliver on the sustainable development goals. And this requires, if I might add, that we overcome our inward looking. Uh, the EIB has always been the bank of the European Union or the European Economic Communities at the time or so, uh, but that meant taking care of the, the, uh, the investment gaps within Europe. Uh, but now we, we come back to the original ideas of the founding fathers of the European Economic Communities, which said, okay, we need the, the European integration process is, the, is our instrument for the mastering of the challenges of the globalization process. That then requires that you need to go beyond your borders and see you preserve your interests, your strategic interests best, by also taking care of what's happening outside. That can lead you to simple de development policies of all kinds, but also to strategic uh, dimensions like uh, uh, clean energy production nowadays. So uh, it's basically on the one hand, uh, going back to the roots, on the other hand, uh, getting out of the straitjacket of domestic thinking. So I, I wanted to pick up, uh, you just said, you know, we need to look outside. And, and you can look outside in two ways, as you said. One is that the strategic interests of the European Union are served not just by investments within the, the geographical boundaries of the Union, but elsewhere globally now, for the reasons you just outlined. Another dimension of looking outside for MDBs is to think beyond their own balance sheets and think of the role that the private sector can play in contributing to the financing of the transitions in energy and, and more broadly in, in the financing of development. And one uh, dimension of the, uh, this is a dimension of the work of MDBs that is often uh, criticized by people in the private sector and outside is saying it's very hard for the MDBs, they don't do enough leveraging. And, and again, somebody said, you know, we should be measuring results not in lending, but in leveraging. You know, how much are you actually able to leverage? And, and uh, most MDBs set targets, uh, often they are all short of them, and sometimes the targets themselves are seen by outsiders as not being ambitious enough. I want to get a little bit your sense, both in terms of EIB, in terms of how you see the sort of role you can play in leveraging private capital, what can be done to do that, but also more broadly, how, what, what should be our level of ambition for the MDBs in terms of their contribution to helping to catalyze and mobilize private capital for financing development and financing climate-related uh, uh, projects in the developing world. So, Success measurement must not go through lending volumes, but impact. That's what counts. And there, I think we have a, a, a good story, because EIB, the, uh, with a balance sheet bigger than the World Bank, is a poor bank when it comes to capital injection by its owners. Uh, theoretically, we have a, a capital of uh, almost 250 billion euros, but unfortunately, most of it is just guarantees. It's callable capital. The member states nev never bother to pay in more than 25 billion euros. So m this leverage from 25 to 600 billion, this is unique. And therefore, we are used to this, this kind of thinking, and we, 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 might, we need more of this. Uh, Lending volumes don't impress me. But if we can say we measure this in terms of uh, reduction of uh, uh, CO2 emissions or uh, reduction, as the World Bank would do, in poverty reduction, that's what counts, and not a simple multiplication of, of lending volumes. Okay. Did you have the I, 
I wanted to ask you a little bit about EIB Global. So this is a new branch, a relatively new, set up um, uh, over a year ago, and this is for uh, investments outside of the EU. So we're a year in, a year or so into EIB Global. What progress has been made um, with, with the rolling out of the branch? And also, if you could talk a little bit about whether you see it has changed uh, the EIB's risk approach uh, in particular, um, its presence in country, uh, and its attempts to mobilize private capital. Yeah, thanks. And yes, so it's one year ago that uh, it was 1st of January 2022 that we started with EIB Global. Of course, we had five decades of activity outside the Union before. But we are still in the process of building it. And in a way, sometimes we, we discuss, it's like we're building the ship while we're sailing. Because of course, the world cannot wait for us to have the perfect EIB global in place. So it is still a process. What we have done is we've put in place a dedicated operational guidelines for the activity outside the Union, both from a risk point of view, but also operationally. And we are maintaining the core of everything that has to do with environment and social standards, procurement, all of this is still the core, but we are much more adapting to the needs of countries or to the needs of the different regions. Because again, it's not the same what we would be doing in Latin America and that what we would be doing in certain countries in Sub-Saharan Africa. So this ability to, to use the strengths of EIB but adapt them better to the different regions is one of the things that we are already putting in place. Uh, risk management, a, a very important element is also governance. We have created a new layer of governance that is dedicated only to the activity outside the Union. So, you know, we're very happy because we finally have their attention. So they, they really, and they're challenging us because that is their role and that's what we were expecting from them. So this is, this is also happening. And the, the third very important thing that we have done is reinforce our presence on the ground. Again, we used to have offices, but now we are having many more people in the offices, more technical staff, more operational staff. And a, a thing that is very important for me is more local staff, because they really bring a different point of view into what we are doing. And they challenge us as well internally. So having these different people that is not only European nationalities, that are working with us is extremely, extremely important. All these offices are always based inside the EU delegation compound. And this is very powerful because then when you come into one of the EU delegations, you see the, the, the diplomats and you see the financial arm of the European Union that is there still supporting those priorities of the European Union in the countries. So these are the types of things that we're doing. We're not finished, it will be a process but we are making good progress and, and we're very motivated by it, I can say. So all of those, there's more and more people that are working in EIB and are saying, can I come to EIB Global? And that is a, also a sign, a sign of success. I also wanted to mention, Masoud, on your question on how difficult it was for the EIB to transform into being the climate bank. I can tell you from the staff point of view, it was very motivating. We didn't have any resistance at all because it's very much aligned with our values. So people wanted to do it. What was sometimes difficult is to convince the clients when they were saying, can you finance this? And then we would have to tell them, no, we cannot finance this, or we cannot finance you. Because one thing that we have done is also, we are having been much more strict about who are the type of counterparts that we're willing to work with. And those that have a lot of brown activity, let's say, even if they come with a green project, we would tell them, no, if you don't have a clear decarbonization path for the whole of your activity, we will not finance you. So all of these things have been difficult to put in place, but getting the staff on board, that was the easiest that part. That was the easier part. That was very oh, easy. Oh, that's good. All right, I, I may, may, may I come yeah, in please, with one more issue on the question of private sector involvement, because yeah. that is indeed the, the main challenge that we need to meet. Why should the private sector work with us? So. Uh, one possibility is that the private sector is uh, 
sitting there with full pockets and would like to, to make best use of it and then say, okay, maybe I buy EIB bonds. But that is then not a big difference whether we use these bonds inside or outside the European Union. Why should somebody buy uh, EIB bonds in general and for external activities in particular? That's a very relevant question because it, it requires two things. Uh, an investor who wants to seize that a bank that invests into big projects has the ambition of getting her or his money back. Uh, that's not a given thing in this world. So the people must trust us. Why do they trust us? And that it goes for other MDBs as well. But for us in particular, number one, and the rating agencies look at that very, very clearly, shareholder support. Can we rely upon your shareholders to step in if something goes wrong? And that is the case with us, with EIB. So our shareholders are very strongly behind us. Secondly, the technical capacity of the institution. We must come up with ambitious projects. If you come with simple projects which have to be, which have been repeated already 25 times, then I, my, my thesis is EIB is not needed. You need to make, make a difference in adding up and that requires to be very, very strong in your technological approach. EIB is a bank that is sometimes, that's my feeling, more run by economists or engineers and natural scientists than by accountants or uh, loan producers. That's key. You have to be ambitious, not only when it comes to the big headlines, but also when it comes to the, the technology level that your projects should have. Absolutely. And I want to open it up and see if we have questions here from the audience in the room, but also if you are online and have a question, please do send it along. Um, let's see. Ooh, so I've got one, two, two questions to start with. So just, and then, then the back. Let's start with the gentleman in the front. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, Rob Colarino with AIAC Family Office. Um, Warner, your question or your comment with respect to private sector participation, could EIB speak a little bit with respect to um, metrics on return? Uh, aside from you know, EBITDA, financial returns, speak a little bit about job creation, um, additional angles of, uh, of either success metrics, because that helps sort of the private sector returns as well. Thank you. Let's, let's take a couple more and then we'll come back. So I think we had the lady right in the back and, and Prashant in the second row. So Prashant, why don't you first? Uh, Prashant Yadav um, at the Center for Global Development. In what you just mentioned, Warren, about ambitious projects, I think we know that greenhouse gas emissions and carbon, I mean, there's lots of projects in that area. There is a demand for it. But there's a lesser number of bankable projects in the pipeline for biodiversity side of the equation. So is it very demand driven that once the projects come, we'll invest in it? Or is there an active effort to foster and incentivize the biodiversity side of the climate agenda actively at EIB? Thank you, Prashant. And if I could just add a footnote to Prashant's project also, which is, and even in the, uh, renewables area, how much of the effort is about building a pipeline of projects rather than about financing a ready group of projects that are sitting out there waiting for financing? Now, I think we have that lady in the back. Hi, I'm Elena Banera from the Climate Policy Initiative. We do research on climate finance. Um, there has been a lot of talk about mo MDBs moving away from funding projects, but moving towards funding country platforms. So JetPs are one of, you know, sort of such examples. So funding kind of coordinated uh, approaches, sectoral approaches that bring together local stakeholders and encourage uh, local currency solutions. So I was wondering what the EIB is doing in supporting those country more systemic level approaches versus uh, projects. Thanks so much. Okay. So incentives for the metrics for thinking about the private sector, biodiversity projects pipeline and, and uh, more generally project pipeline building, and then 
the country platforms and, and JetPeats is an example of them rather than focusing on projects. So they, which I come back to you for these th three and then we'll do another round. Maybe I start with, yeah, go uh, ahead. Uh, <laughs> compliment. with, with the first one and, and you can compliment it certainly. I think it is in our DNA that we take these metric questions very, very seriously. Uh, and of course, uh, you have classical accounting standards that you have to observe, but on the other hand, they are not the answer. The answer come with the impact measurement that uh, you, you can bring to the table. And there, I think we are quite, quite ambitious. And we can use this as arguments in order to convince people who are thinking of cooperating with us or even uh, entrusting us their money. The, the, the case of um, um, biodiversity is, is combinable with that question. Because why are we so far ahead with, let's say, CO2 reduction projects in comparison to biodiversity projects? Well, exactly because of the difficulties of the measurement of success. In nature-related questions or projects, the measurement of the success is much more demanding and difficult than if you can say, okay, I measure my success in the reduction of CO2 emissions. So this is why uh, the, the metrics questions and the, the methodologies behind it are so important. Uh, on, on jet piece and, and the pipeline of, of project, maybe you step in or we divide it up. Yes, no, 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 happy to, happy to do that. But I wanted to come back on the question of employment uh, measurement, because this is clearly yeah. one of the impact indicators that we have for each one of our projects. So we will calculate ex ante, and it is one of the, it's part of the proposal that we make to the governing bodies, what is the expected job creation of the project. And then, during the implementation, we continue measuring, and then we will report about it at the end as well. No? But in particular, employment creation is a difficult one. We can, we can easily create um, indicators for direct employment. You can even consider indirect employment. You know, but what about induced employment? When you're building a bridge, it's not about how many people work on, on, on building the bridge. It's about what is the economic activity that that bridge is going to enable. And, and there, very quickly, there are, there are models. We have a lot of discussions with the other NDBs about it. But very quickly, you go into science fiction. So, it, and we are a very solid bank. So when we report, we report on the direct. And when we can, and we have certainty on the indirect. But it's a, it's a fascinating topic to, to, to discuss. On biodiversity, it is a difficult, a difficult area for all of us. The area where we are more active is in, in improving productivity in agriculture. Because by doing this and working on value chains, and also looking at it from the regulatory point of view from the European <coughs> Union and, and all the directives or the prospective directives on, on reduction of, of the deforestation, we can be addressing this type of, of issues. We have had very good meetings with the Global Adaptation Center. And here, technical assistance is going to be very important to make sure that we are embedding adaptation and biodiversity um, aspects into each one of the projects or into many of the projects that, that we're working on. on. On building the pipeline of projects, this is clearly the key. You know, this is, in a way, how we can make, uh, have a much greater impact than the 10 billion of lending or the whatever is the mobilized investment that we are, we are having. Because when you do this, you're doing it for everyone. And we have seen, IFC has been fantastic with scaling solar, for example, and we've been co-financing with them with scaling solar. So then, together with the European Commission, we came up with a similar system that is not only for solar, it's also for wind. So it's for all the renewable energy um, technologies. And it is about working with countries so that they put in place the right framework for the tenders for renewable energy in the countries. And then many other participants will finance and, and particularly the private sector will be attracted. Here, possibly what you need to do is provide a, a guarantee on the off-taker. So this type of, of activities are happening. We, are, we have the benefit that we have the European Commission that is very much on our, on our side when we are doing these things. And country platforms, yes, we are of course participating in each one of the JetPs that are, that are out there. 
with the difficulties of each one of the GFPs. And you know, you've mentioned you've had just had a session about it, so I'm sure you have discussed it uh, at length. Of course, we knew none of them were going to be easy. The countries that where we are discussing GFPs are, are clearly not the easy ones. But that's why it is particularly impactful, and that's why we need to, to continue pushing. I wanted to mention in this context also the Resilience and Sustainability Trust Fund or facility that IMF has put in place using rechanneled special drawing rights, because this is another way in which you can work at full country level. And there, IMF reached out to us because we are the Climate Bank. They know we have a lot of experience in terms of identification of green projects. And here, we, they want to work in a different way. They don't have the expertise on projects. We have it. And we are collaborating with them on each one of the, of the pilot countries. So there are things that are happening also at country level. We are a, a bank that is very much focused on, on, on projects. Yeah, th that is not going to be completely changing, but we're going much beyond. Yes. Right. Uh, can I just ask a follow-up question? Maria, you were talking about building the project pipeline. Now, for, for investments within the EU, um, the EIB has the, the European Investment Advisory Hub, which is essentially a one-stop shop for all technical assistance, you know, project support, project development. What about for external um, lending, for those, uh, for investments outside of the EU? Would it not be a solution <laughs> to set up a similar it, type of... It would, it would. It's, it's, we're working on it, we're working on it. What we are already working on, and that's probably the first part you're going to see for outside the union, is technical assistance for climate adaptation. Because climate adaptation, again, is one of the more difficult areas. Mitigation seems to be, or more flows of funds are going to mitigation and much less to adaptation. So we are going to start with extending that uh, hub for um, technical assistance on adaptation to support countries and then hopefully into other areas. So, but I, I like the, the question very much. We really need to do much better on this. Yes, I think that seems to be I mean, if you look at the conversations around uh, why we can't do projects, the private sector will say, or others, uh, this shortage of projects that are ready uh, comes up often and often. And uh, even though there are a lot of uh, initiatives and facilities for project preparation, somehow there, that connection is not being made. So either Maybe it's just an excuse sometimes used by people to say there aren't enough good projects or maybe it's uh, what's the right mix, uh, how, how broad and how deep is that problem. It does come up uh, often. So uh, any, now let's just do a quick second round before we close. So I've got one over there. Thank you very much. My name is Sonia Dunlop from E3G, a climate change think tank. I have a question uh, uh, for each of you. Uh, President Hoyer, you said you thought that cooperation amongst the MDBs is really uh, active and also important in the climate space. President Jin from the AIIB is pushing this idea of an institutional mechanism for coordinating the 10 MDBs on climate and every two years having an annual meeting that's all 10 MDBs together. And I was just wondering if you supported those ideas from AIIB. And um, Ms. Shaw Barrigan, you mentioned that you're asking your counterparties to not just invest in green projects, but have a green transition plan for their entire institution. Can you say a bit more about that? Because I know you have the PATH framework. Does that also apply to EIB global transactions with counterparties outside the EU? Is it being applied? And what's the what's the forward path on that? Because that is the way to green financial systems in recipient countries, in countries of operation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other question before? Just one more here, and then we'll come back. Uh, my name is uh, Prashant Parmaswar, and I work with the Wilson Center. Um, I just had a, a quick question on, we talked about the global um, sort of influence and, and focus. Uh, my own focus is Asia, um, and so I'm just interested in this conversation about Asia and the Indo-Pacific, where does the EIB fit in that, the EU's Indo-Pacific strategy? And also, I know there have been some developments about you know, opening of new offices, I think one in Indonesia, another one in, in mm -hmm. Fiji. Mm -hmm. um, how, how does that uh, sort of speak to the diversification of um, efforts within the Asia-Pacific and Indo-Pacific region? And if you could say a little bit particularly about Southeast Asia, 
um, that'd be appreciated. I think there was an earlier conversation about jet peace in both Indonesia and Vietnam, but I'm particularly interested in the conversation beyond those two countries because there are a lot of smaller Southeast Asian countries, like Laos, for example, um, that also have you know huge um, energy transition issues. Thanks. Thank you, Zach. Did you have a, a online question you wanted to ask? There's a question um, from Twitter. So it says that uh, Werner, you said that. Uh, MDBs are by far not where they should be on climate, um, but clearly thinks that EIB is doing great. Uh, if online participation were possible, uh, sorry, <laughs> okay. Uh, he would like to ask who needs to change, I suppose. Uh, <laughs> seems uh, All right, thank you for that pointing. question. Now, so maybe this is also an opportunity because we're running out of time for uh, respond to those questions, but also any final words. Maybe I'll start with uh, you, Marie, and then let uh, President Hoyer have the final word. Very good, and, and I'll respond very quickly. The, the PATH framework, and I encourage everyone to Google it, and you'll see a lot of information on our website. It does fully apply also outside the European Union. We are not having any shortcuts. We are not treating our activity different outside than, than inside, because it would be very hypocritical. You know, we, we believe in the same for, for the countries outside the European Union or inside. So we are applying the same, and it is not easy to apply, I can tell you. Huh? But at the same time, we are convinced it's the right way forward. Um, and on the question on, on Asia, we certainly uh, are very active in Asia. In fact, I, I was saying before that our activity in Asia and Latin America is not the same as in Africa. In Asia, we are completely focused on climate action. In fact, in, in terms of the measurement of the MDBs that we have a common measurement of our climate action activities, in Asia we are at 80 something, almost 90% of what we do is climate, be it mitigation or, or, or adaptation. So, because that's where we think we can add more value. There are many needs in Asia, we are not going to be able to cover all of them, so we might as well concentrate in where our strengths lie. And this, yes, I'm very happy that you've noticed that we've very recently opened an office in, in Jakarta. We also, it was now just a month ago, in, in Fiji for the, for the Pacific. So we do want to strengthen our activity. Also in the context of the European Union's initiative that is called Global Gateway. And Global Gateway really has a very strong outlook towards Asia, and that's where we will be accompanying. Um, well, on the question uh, on concerning uh, Jin Lee King's uh, proposal on the on the word of the uh, MDBs, I'm, I'm fully in with him. I'm looking forward to meeting him tonight. Uh, for the last year, uh, I've had the, the honor to chair the group of the 10 MDBs. And I must say, this is a difficult thing. And uh, because the ambition is there with probably everybody to get more out of the cooperation. But when it then gets concrete, it's sometimes a little bit difficult. Uh, th these uh, 10 MDBs, and there are lots of talk of MDB reform and, and all these things. Jesus Christ, there are 10 different animals, <laughs> totally different animals. And it's uh, so there are, uh, one size fits all solution does not exist. So, so we need to see where we have common ground. With many of them on, on the climate issues, we have common ground. And I think uh, more can, can be done there. And uh, I see with great interest what kind of developments are taking place here in Washington. That's going to be a big boost for the cooperation among, among the MDBs, I think. Uh, just to add what uh, Maria responded to the question on, on the Pacific, Pacific Islands. One of my first experiences, uh, almost 12 years ago when I came to EIB, to EIB was to go back, go back to the Pacific region because in my former capacity in foreign affairs, I've been there frequently. And I went to Vanuatu. And in Vanuatu, I, had one, we, I saw one of the most uh, surprising projects I've ever seen, a, a, a wind farm, which gave justice to the fact that they sometimes have terrible winds there, which no windmill can stand. So our engineers, together with the people in the region, they developed a system that you can lay down a wind tower. And when the wind is gone, you put it up again. Otherwise, it would have been destroyed. So we are in that region. And I think um, we should give even much more attention to the problems of small island states. 
that goes far beyond the, the Indo-Pacific region. We yesterday had a fantastic talk with Mia Motley from, from Barbados. And uh, I think we are seen there as a, uh, a surprisingly interested institution among the big MDBs when it comes to the smallest uh, countries in the region. Because the effect, the impact that we can have is enormous. And therefore, uh, I would welcome a closer cooperation with the, with the small island states, be they in the Pacific or the Caribbean or elsewhere. Thank you very much, Ron um, Our time is up, and I want to take this moment to thank Maria and uh, Ron Hoya both for uh, their contribution, their interventions, their responses to the question. And uh, on behalf of uh, Mikhail and myself, uh, thank you for joining us. But I'd like to ask all of you to also join us now in, in thanking our panelists. Thank you. Thank you.